Welcome to this tutorial about pandas. No, it's not about animals, it's about a library in Python. This tutorial is part of the data handling tutorial series that is all in the Jupyter Notebook P06 minus Pynome that you can find in the course repository. You may already have run now through the sections here above that were about um, loading and writing basic data types, then about NumPy, and now about uh, pandas. So what is pandas or why do you want to use pandas? Well, pandas is very useful for a couple of reasons. In general, it simplifies your data analysis. It enables you to label your columns and your rows, for example. You can run statistics on these rows and it tweaks or, uh, to many other libraries that you can then very simply apply to a so-called pandas se data series or pandas data frame. I will jump here over the installation instructions if you have installed that uh, Fluss environment, and maybe with the Fluss tools, um, you will um, have pandas already on your system. To work with pandas, the typical way for importing it is to use the alias pd. So that is import pandas as pd. If you're a French native speaker, that might sound a little bit weird. Let's have a look at the pandas data frames and data series and what that is. First here in that code block, I'm importing pandas now as pd. Um, I'm, uh, I'm printing here an example of a pandas series. In that series here, I'm using the values 3, 4 and np.nan. If you didn't run the above tutorial on NumPy before, you may need to import NumPy as NP here to run this code block. So that here is the result of the first command. It builds you a pandas data frame here with just one series. So pandas data frame is nothing else than the accumulation of pandas series. Now let's uh, have a look here at a little bit more uh, an example. So I'm creating here something like a workbook like data frames, workbook like in the sense of that you have like in an office spreadsheet calculator columns A, B, C, and then you have rows one, two, and three. So the default here of pandas would be to create rows zero, one, two, and um, Python style, if you prefer having them numbered as one, two, three, this example here uh, shows you how to create here a data frame with random values. So that uses here numpy's random.rand function. It uses index, the row names. So the index is what I created here with a numpy arrange function from one to four. So one, two, three in this case, because I'm using here a step width of one. And I'm using here as columns, so column names A, B, C. If you want to rename these column names, you can do that by just using here the workbook like data frame dot rename built in function and use here that dictionary to replace the column names. So that dictionary requires that the keys, the dictionary keys are actual names of columns of your uh, data frame and the values are then the ones that replace the current column names. If you want to transpose your data frame, you can also do that. So you just swap here your data frame with the dot capital T command. There are many options to build a pandas data frame. And here's another one by using a dictionary. And that dictionary here, I am using a uh, flow depth or water depth 
um, column that I'm creating as a pandas series. Here I'm still assigning with random uniform values to that using uh, in the numpy.random.uniform function. Then I'm using here another column that is sediment. Maybe did you have a sediment feed during your experiment? Yes, no, yes, no. Um, that corresponds you to the length of the series or the water depth or flow depth measurements. Then there's another column here that I call um, categorical. Um, categorical again, in terms of it's fluvial or supercritical or a critical flow regime as a function of the so-called uh, route number. And the other question here or the other column here is if water was in my channel. Well, water was always in my channel, otherwise the experiment uh, didn't run. So that is here the result of this workbook. I didn't assign here any specific index name, so that's why it uses the standard row names of 0, 1, 2, 3. I'm getting here random uniform uh, water depths. I'm getting sediment here, yes, no, yes. The water flow regime here is something that I um, just imposed here on the experiments. No, can't, can't be sure that's true. The second uh, and third statements here in that code block show the data frame just printed. So that is here the reason for why you see that part here. And that here, the df.dtypes shows the data types of the columns. That is important to get you uh, to know your data, for example. So here I get here the information that my flow depth or water depth is float 32. Sediment is an object, string object, and the uh, flow regime is categorical because I'm using here the pandas.categorical um, data type to assign that. That is very important if you're looking at, uh, uh, at your data and a larger data set. Um, so categorical data is uh, a very important uh, class that you can have. And water is again just an object, it's a string object here in this case. What can also be just nice to ver for verifying if your data set is complete or is understood by Python as you want it is to have a look at just the head, so meaning the first um, one or two rows of your data set, just checking if the column names are correct, if the data are correct, uh, resum to what you have in your data set, and then also to have a look at the end, so at the tail of your data set. So here, that number in the function arguments defines how many rows you want to see of your data set. Here's now an example of creating another pandas data frame with now reasonable fraud numbers. So that fraud number is what characterizes if a flow regime is fluvial, critical, or supercritical. Um, but if you're somewhere in the lab and you're measuring that, then you will probably rather talk about nearby critical or from the slow side or nearby critical from the fast side. So that is why you might, may want to use um, categories of fluvial, nearby critical from the slow side, critical, nearby critical from the fast side, and supercritical um, as a function of the fraud number. So in this code block here, I'm assigning here these centers of these categories in a dictionary. Then I'm using here again a numpy random uniform function here to just sample some random fraud number values that are somewhere between 0 0.01 and 2.0, so perfectly in the range between uh, fluvial and supercritical, could also be higher. And then here I'm using um, that little line here with a small lambda function involved to classify the fraud number that I just sampled here as either fluvial, um, somewhat critical or supercritical. Then I'm, I'm building here an observation data frame. If this 
cold line here looks fuzzy to you, please have a look again at the functions tutorial. Have a look at the lambda functions and understand then step by step what this line does. So that is the result of that line. You see it works perfectly well. We have here measured frog number 1.69, uh, something like that, which is super critical. You can rerun that code block here as often as you want. It will always um, create you here some, uh, uh, some classification of a flow regime. Let's come back to the case where you want to append some data to a pandas data frame or an existing set of data. Pandas has some built-in methods like add, log, concat and append which work reasonably well, but they can be really slow in particular if you have a data frame that has more than something like 10,000 elements. So that is why I recommend to follow this workflow here if you want to append data to a pandas data frame. The workflow involves first to take your observation data frame or the original data frame, convert it to a dictionary. So that dot to dict converts any pandas data frame to a dictionary. Then we gonna append the new row or the new data that we want to append by updating the dictionary. Let's just run that code block here for uh, some visualization and add here a print command to visualize the uh, dictionary. So that is how the to dict uh, command will convert the, um, uh, the pandas data frame a dictionary. So you see here the first entry uh, item here of the uh, of that uh, dictionary is the measured column, right? That was this year. And then we have here as a, a value for that measured key the uh, row number as keys, and then the measurement values as values. The second key of that uh, dictionary is the flow re regime column, so that's this year, which is then as a key and uh, sorry as a value another dictionary, and that dictionary again holds then this 0, uh, 1, 2 and so on column index, uh, sorry row indexes um, with the supercritical classifications as value. So now here to append a new row, here I'm updating now the index here. So I'm, exist I'm updating the existing color names and appending new data for that. And then I'm appending new columns here with a new column name. So the reason for why you have here already the, these extra column printed is because I ran that code block twice. So here you see the example for appending the new row and here the example for appending a new column where I'm iterating on the keys of the measured value. It doesn't actually matter on what, um, on what keys here I, I would iterate here on. It's just important here to get all row numbers um, so that I can add here something uh, like with sediment. And here I'm just using some uh, random function to assign a boolean for sediment existence that is then true or false. Finally, I am reconverting now my dictionary into a pandas data frame with the function of pd.dataframe.fromdict. I'm using the dictionary of observations, the updated one. I already saw that and here is the updated dictionary here with um, the, uh, so the tail of that. After this short example, let's have a look at other examples for converting pandas data frame into something. 
So something could be a NumPy array. So let's take that observation data frame and convert it to a NumPy array with the dot to NumPy function. So that produces us a two-dimensional NumPy array with values here of a measured fraud number, the classified regime, and if sediment was present or not. We can also access certain data frame entries only with the df.log or ilog functions. So dot log would use for the index a row name and for the uh, column label a column name here. So if my row names are two, uh, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, I can just write here 2 and then my column names uh, was the flow depth. Um, then it would print here the uh, row number 2 of column flow depth. The iloc function uses a number, so that is here then the row number 2 and column number 0 and that is essentially the same here because column number zero was my water depth or flow depth in the data frame. I can also reshape a data frame, for instance here by just creating a new data frame uh, through stacking water depth or flow depth and uh, sediment. So here I'm creating a data frame with two row, uh, rows, one is uh, flow depth, water depth, the other one is sediment, yes, no, and then the column names are just the row names from before. I can also use the um, option to stack an array. So that is here the array just stacked here by um, zero, the entry number zero, and that here would be the unstack one. So I would unstack it then. More interesting now is the pivot method. So if you have a very big data set, then you're probably interested only into a smaller subset of the data at some point. To do so, you can use the dataframe.pivot method with, that takes as input arguments the index. So um, the index should be the sediment we say here. We say the columns should be the flow depth and water depth. Um, don't be confused here. I'm using the column names of the data frame and the, uh, for um, assigning an index and a columns variable here that will be in the pivoted table. And what I want them here to have then is the flow regime. So running that here will print me the flow regime values for the case of uh, flow depth or water depth here. So that these are now the uh, columns and the rows here of sediment, no or yes. So because I didn't have for all um, water depth, um, uh, sorry, uh, of flow regime tables here, the same uh, for all water depth here, uh, measurement with and without sediment, I will get here and the N values for the no sediments here when, no, when sediment was present and vice versa when sediment was not present. This here is just another example where I'm not using now um, the flow regime, I'm using now the same index and currency, here, but I'm using water, which basically results in the same or similar output. Now only it uses um, the presence of water, uh, yes or no. There's also the option to use the pivot table function that um, enables you to apply something uh, like an office-like or a spreadsheet calculator-like function. The pivot table function looks slightly different from what you've seen before with the df.pivot table. So it takes now as arguments the index and the columns, still as before. Now the difference is instead of having here the brackets, I'm using here the um, variable of which I want to have the values in the pivot table here as um, values. And now I'm using the aggregate function that I want to apply to these values. So this gives me now the, the numpy mean or the mean of the water data here. Pandas also massively simplifies 
file handling. Um, so it makes it much easier to open and write certain file types. You have already seen in one of the previous tutorials um, reading or rather writing a CSV file. I'm going to come back later to that exactly, which you can also do in pandas with um, bd.readcsv or you can then write also a pandas data frame with two CSV. There are other formats that you can use like a Google BigQuery or JSON files, HTML files, HDF5 format and so on, SQL formats. Those are probably pretty specific for the application that you want to use. It can be very interesting here in the sense um, of water resources uh, management is um, the usage of uh, basement files maybe for uh, working with a JSON uh, files and pandas or adapting that. One or the last but maybe not least option here of that um, uh, of that table here were workbook handling handling with pandas with the read Excel and to Excel functions. So obviously that makes reference to a very um, famous spreadsheet handling software and the way how you can use that now is um, for example here with the measurement data that we have been creating before in the uh, tutorials on NumPy and um, file handling to use it now just pd.readcsv so pandas.readcsv where here is the file name so that requires that you have here the data subfolder with the modified CSV file now. Then as a column separator we'll use now a comma so that's different from NumPy's uh, uh, load txt where the it was not separator but delimiter the uh, keyword argument. Then header is none because we didn't have a header um, but we're gonna call these columns now test one two three to four. Um, the next line here I'm just printing the head now of that um, resulting read of the CSV file so it's basically now just a data frame that's why I can apply here the head function to it and then I'm writing it again here with the to excel command as modified data minus workbook or bw and I'm calling that here giving that here a sheet name with some random date. So that here is now the result of the head where I have my named uh, columns with test one, two, three, four, and the rows that I did not uh, specify in terms of the name. So this workbook will now live here in your data folder and here your modified data workbook. In that little application here, you won't be able to open the XLSX file, so that is why you have here the screenshot. Just note here that pandas will try to convert all your data into float type, but as soon as you will encounter a text variable in the column, then everything else is going to be a string data type in the workbook. So that is why here in the columns where we had NAN values, you have here that little warning that these are actually not numbers, but uh, imported here as text or were written as text in your workbook. You can also um, use here again NumPy's NAN, um, value, um, NAN value or data type here as a little workaround. So in that case you would now take again our measurement data, which is again now here the pandas data frame and to a pandas data frame we can directly use here that uh, replace command. We are replacing these strings with np.nan. So just recall here, by calling here that CSV file, we are calling the one that had the NAN values as strings, not the NAN values as numpy.nan. With the uh, measurement data, uh, data frame then, we can also apply then here that function uh, to numeric which tries to convert then everything that's in the data frame to a numeric um, variable. Now I'm using here namespace to write the workbook with the pandas uh, excel writer object. 
So let's run a little code block. And now I'm, I will have here a new um, workbook that is now EW, um, like Excel writer object. And in that case now, the NAN values disappeared and all numbers now are real numbers and all columns. I have been briefly mentioning before the usage of categorical data that uh, in the framework here of that fraud number example. I mentioned also already that categorical data can be very useful when you're running any data analysis. And here's just a small example of how that could be useful um, with, for example, um, observer based categories of a flume. So with our experience, maybe we have observed, so subjectively, fluvial conditions, dry conditions, critical conditions, nearby critical conditions, or a measurement error. So in the case of a dry flume observation or a measurement error observation, we actually want our observations to be categorically not considered. So the, and this is why we're using here now the pandas.categorical um, data type with the observation examples and we're using as categories the flow regimes. And only if that falls into something um, realistic here, then it should uh, assign here a real value or a real category to the observations. So now our dry observation and measurement errors are just NAN. I mentioned that pandas is very useful for statistical data analysis. So it only makes sense to have now also a look at statistics that you can derive from a pandas data frame. The very first command here that I want to provide you with is the dot describe function. So if you run that, you get a basic overview of your data sets column wise. So for every column here, test one to four, I get the counts. So the number of values that are in the, um, uh, in the columns, I get the mean value, I get the standard deviation, the mean minimum value, the maximum values, and the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentiles. There are many other statistics that you can use here and they overlap with NumPy methods or make use also of the NumPy methods. So you can get here the absolute values, accumulated product, cum, and cum sum, so those are not exactly statistics. Um, but you can uh, also get the min, the mean, min, max, mode, uh, the product standard deviation and so on. So let's just have a look at here at a bunch of them applied to our tests. So that is how the mean would look like, this is how the median would look like, and this is how the standard deviations would look like for our measurement data. You can also directly use pandas to make histograms because pandas also tweaks into the matplotlib library, something that I will present in another tutorial. If you want to apply your own custom functions to a pandas data frame, also that is possible. You may remember that little feed to meter function from the functions tutorial that I implemented here in a script that I call dataconverter.py. Um, if you want to import that here, then you will need here a function, so a fun folder that has an init.py. So here you can recall the um, tutorial on packages and modules and libraries. And in that lives here the converter.py that looks like that. So here's our feed to meter function. And that is what I'm importing here. Then I'm creating here a pandas data frame where I have one column that is feeds and the other one is uh, feeds is uh, uh, better be feed. The uh, with a random random int value, so just another option here to create random um, 
values with NumPy. I'm giving it a size of 6 and these values should be somewhere between 0 and 100. Then I'm creating another column here that also has the size of 6, so it's just NumPy 1 of 6 and I'm multiplying it here with numpy.nan because I do not know them yet. I want to calculate the meters or the meter values then. So to apply now the feed to meter function to the feeds column or feed column and apply and calculate the meters column from that, I'm using here the dot apply built-in function and I provide it with my feed to meter function. So let's run that and we see perfectly well the conversion of the feed values to meters. Dates and time data are somewhat a specific data type if you want. If you want to refer, for example, to a specific day or hour in a, in a day, in a month, in a year, it's hard to refer with something like we are in day uh, 2025.0, so you cannot use just a decimal separator for that. What you can do is using pandas timestamp class here to create, for instance, here a timestamp. So this year would create a timestamp um, that is in the year 2025, month 01, so January and day 001 at the time 12, so the hour number 12. These three commands here result in the same timestamp, once here defined as a text uh, string, once here defined with a month, uh, years, month, day and hour keywords and once you're defined without keywords, just what is here important is the order. What pandas actually does here with its timestamp command is just a mimicking here the um, datetime.datetime package. So why do you still want to use now something um, like the datetime.type and datetime package and handle um, specifically dates and times. Well, at some point, maybe you want to subtract data, uh, uh, dates and times, so add, for instance, a certain time period or subtract a certain time period. So you could, for example, use here the date time package, import this dt, and define a start date. So now here our start date here is an year 2024, month number um, 2 here, uh, day number 25, and um, hour 22 uh, and 30 minutes, 0 seconds. So, so why am I referring here to that year 24 in February? Well, let's have a look here now still the end date, which is month 3 and day 2. Hour 2, minute 15, second 30. So now just count the days from, the, uh, from February 25 to day here number 2 and the number of hours and you will get why I, I might use here the year 2024. This is probably a very good example for why you want to use something like date time because you can um, very well account for leap years. If you want to use a time delta, so here I'm defining a time difference by using the date time dot time delta. I want to use here a time delta of 23 hours. Now I'm using the actual time, so that's the start date. And now I am uh, printing here the current time as long as the actual time is smaller equals to the end date. And this is the result here. And you get here. Um, our February 29, so our leap year um, uh, date uh, printed to the console. Thanks for watching these tutorials on data and file handling and in particular this last section on pandas.